distinguished participants, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to express my deep gratitude to Louise and the Foundation for inviting me here. This is my third time here three years in a row. So you might wonder, why do I keep coming back? Louise forces us to reflect, to learn, to network. Um, this morning, we, our session is beginning again at the GA. We're expecting President Obama and so on. So I'm hoping I'm here then rush back to listen to the, to the great man. But it's always a pleasure to come here. It was here that I met Dambisa Moyo, Ted Turner, uh, Femi Oke, and many other people. So I have an opportunity. That's why I always come back, interact with people. Thank you for giving everybody that opportunity. Businessmen, ourselves in the UN system, and also uh, policy makers like the great leaders we have this morning. We're reflecting on the MDGs after 10 years of trying to achieve them around the world. Let me just mention three elements, and relate, they are related to what Louis said in the opening. She talked a lot about Africa. I'm from Africa, and when Dambisa, Femi, and I were here at one session, we always say, don't talk about the old Africa. Talk about the Africa of the future. We represent a different Africa. We represent an Africa that is ambitious, well-educated, we're in the diaspora, we're at home, and we've proven ourselves in top academic institutions in the West, and we are looking at a different Africa. Yesterday I said to some of the leaders, I say, because there was a lot of discussion about emerging issues, and when I listened to the speeches, people were talking about an old Africa. So I said to them, and that's part of the message here, we must distinguish between poverty management and poverty reduction. What is poverty management? Poverty management is when you move somebody from $1 a day, and they now move to $2 a day. And we clap our hands, whoa, we doubled their income, they're now above the poverty line. They're still poor. Real poverty reduction requires wealth creation. That's why these forums are important. You need investments to come in. You need trade, you need infrastructure. And second, point, energy. We believe energy access is the missing Millennium Development Goal. I give you some numbers. Over 80% of CO2 emissions come from energy systems, transport, power generation, heating of homes, etc. 80%. Over 60% of all greenhouse gases come from energy systems. So you cannot fix climate change without an energy revolution. Impossible. But in this 21st century, 3 billion people still use biomass. 1.6 billion are not connected to electrical supply at all, modern energy services, 1.6 billion. And the worst one is about 2 million people die every year from indoor air pollution from use of biomass, most of them women and children. Hillary Clinton yesterday, lunchtime, launched a cook stove initiative for, under the CGI, we were all there. She's put 50 million, hoping to mobilize 250. Because energy access is also about gender economic empowerment. It is the women who fetch the wood. It is the women who go and fetch the water. They need energy to pump that in. And then they cook and poison themselves. Some of the, the concentration of smoke and uh, incom incomplete combustion of some particles is almost 200 times what EPA allows in the United States. And people are dying around the world. You cannot achieve rapid economic growth without energy access. But we have an energy revolution going on. We hope the rest of the world will join that revolution. But this is not about energy this morning. I just wanted to put a footnote on that. We have great leaders who have other emerging issues. Our panel is great. Uh, we have on the panel Her Excellency, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Mrs. Prasad Bisasar. Thank you for joining the panel. Uh, Mrs. Bisasa was elected Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in May 2010, becoming the first woman to become a head of government of that dynamic twin island of the Caribbean state. She has been a legislator in Trinidad and Tobago Parliament for the past 24 years, serving in such important capacities as Attorney General, Minister of Education, Minister of Legal Affairs, and Leader of the Opposition. And I know from one of her ministers 
when I met the minister in Brazil, in Brazil at the ECLAC summit, she said, keep talking about energy systems. We can teach the world about that. We also have His Excellency President Stephenson King of St. Lucia. Well, St. Lucia, when I started development economics at the University of Illinois almost 20 years ago, we had to read, one of our first readings was about Arthur Lewis, a nation that has generated several Nobel laureates. But yes, thanks to Arthur Lewis, I changed my major to development economics. So it's an honor to have you on our panel. His Excellency is a graduate of the Seventh Day Adventist Academy. After graduation, Mr. King served in the banking sector in St. Lucia Cooperative Bank from 1978 to 1981. He then went on to serve in the Floizek and Girodi Chambers of Law from 1982 to 1987. Thank you for joining our panel, sir. We also have President Lobo Sosa of Honduras. Excellency, thank you for being here. Uh, he holds a degree in business administration from the University of Miami. After completing his studies, he engaged in the family's agricultural business to become a successful businessman of his own as one of the largest corn exporters in Honduras. Excellency, you are very important in this panel because we need to increase food production by 50% by 2030 and by 70% by 2050. But with climate change, one of the worst heat regions will be Africa. Our yields will drop by 50% if business as usual continues. Those who did not commit the crime of climate change will pay the highest price. So we hope you can link some of this with food security. I'll call on our first panelist, Your Excellency, Madam Prime Minister. Thank you very much, sir. The, His Excellency, the President of Honduras, Honorable Prime Minister of St. Lucia, our neighbor in the Caribbean, Excellencies here in the audience, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin by thanking Luis and the Foundation for inviting us to participate in this very exciting summit. Um, I said to Luis when I walked in that I had been reading up on the internet, um, so before we have met, I would have known so much about her. I want to congratulate her and ask you to give a round of applause for the tremendous work she has been doing. As I address you now, it is at a time when our countries face the united challenge of the global economic crisis. And I'm reminded of the words of a former head of the UN, Kofi Annan, and he said, I quote, whether our task is fighting poverty, stemming the spread of disease, or saving innocent lives from mass murder, we have seen that we cannot succeed without the leadership of the strong, and the engagement of all. And I think this is why we're all here together. I'm of the view that no nation must stand alone now. And so the United Nations and this coming together could not be at a more opportune time as we face the challenges as individual nations, but we face the challenges as a human race, as Louise mentioned, our species really um, on the verge of being wiped out or vanishing, or so many of the other species on planet Earth are being wiped out. And so for those of us in policy-making positions and those who assist us in making that policy, as we look at the areas that we want to concentrate on, we have so much that we can learn from each other. And so the partnering of nations now in terms of strategies and solutions for taking us forward really is very vital. If I may share with you a few initiatives that we have undertaken since taking office uh, in May of this year that we see as being important to take us forward for children and for grandchildren, yes. Because it is always said that we do not own this planet Earth. We inherited it from our forefathers and we hold it in trust for children and grandchildren. And so the decisions we make today will ensure that there is a prosperity and progress for children and grandchildren 
or the opposite of that. And so we are at a very vital point. I understand Louise's comment when she said that <clears throat> the post-World War children, and I'm one of them, um, we have been spoiled, yes. But we face crises in so many areas now. We are looking at the financial crisis. We look at natural disaster. We look at climate change. So in so, so many areas, we really need to share the solutions for taking us forward. So firstly, what are the areas of concern? And before I say that, I will say that to listen is very important. In order for good leadership, we must first listen, and then we take decisions. And this is what we did in Trinidad and Tobago. This is what our conversations were with our population, listening first to the areas they were concerned with. What was one of those? One of those areas had to do with the environment and degradation of the environment whole issue of climate change that Louise has raised. And that area had to do with not one smelter plant in a small island like Trinidad, not two smelter plants, but three. There was a proposal for three smelter plants in this tiny, beautiful island in the Southern Caribbean. And the people said, no way. We do not want it. Stop the smelter. That's one of the reasons why the government changed. We listened to them. And when we formed the government, as of May, we stopped the smelter plants in our tiny island. Strategies, as we listen, poverty eradication. How do we deal with poverty eradication? Our nation is a very blessed one for natural resources because we are high in oil and natural gas. Indeed, 66% of the natural gas coming into the United States comes from Trinidad and Tobago. We are very dependent on our energy sector. But we understand the dangers of that. And so we are looking to diversify our economy. And many of our, our island states, and Lucia is here, um, we have, we, we've had a history of exploitation of what may seem to be a competitive advantage of a natural resource. So at first, our islands, our nations in the Caribbean, they were sugar islands. And everything was made outside of our islands, of our nations. So the sugar was there, the cane was grown, and everything was taken out to be manufactured elsewhere. And when King Sugar died, for us in Trinidad and Tobago, it became king, oil and natural gas. And the same thing continues to happen, that the oil is exploited, natural gas is taken, goes elsewhere, and we import everything else. And so we understand we cannot continue to survive with all our eggs in the basket of the energy sector, and therefore, we have to diversify. We must diversify that economy. And we've been <coughs> saying this all along, but somehow it just has not uh, been done. It's not getting there. And so there's a tremendous challenge for us to diversify, to go into other areas. We are looking at tourism. We are looking at, uh, of course, alternative energy sources. Um, we are looking at areas for manufacturing. But indeed, we'll have to continue to expand within the energy sector. In terms of poverty eradication, I'm saying, whilst all this wealth came to us in Trinidad and Tobago from the oil and energy sector, it didn't reach down to the ordinary people. And so we still have, in my view, unacceptable levels of poverty in Trinidad and Tobago. And so what we've done in this budget, which we passed just last week in our parliament, we've allocated a substantial portion of our budget to a new ministry that I created, the Ministry of the People and Social Development. And we've given them a very large slice of the budget. Dealing with poverty and also with health issues, we all have our greatest love for our children. And in Trinidad and Tobago, our health sector could not deal with all medical issues. And therefore, we had to find a way to stop our children from dying because the parents could not afford life-saving medicines and surgery that could only be obtained abroad and not in Trinidad and Tobago. And so we established a children's life fund where the government would put some into the fund, but then we partner with the private sector and with individuals, whether it's one cent, two cents, three cents. In my country, we have a calypso which says five cents, 10 cents, a dollar wine. Whatever each person can give to contribute and has been working tremendously well. Again, Louise, your point about communities, sourcing communities. And so our thrust is people-centered, people-oriented, 
and of course, to listen to the people first. I thank you all very much. So many more ideas I would love to share with you, but time will not permit. Again, thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Madam, for your insights and giving us an indication of the wonderful policies that you're beginning to put in place to diversify your economy and ensure that indeed prosperity spreads to, to everybody, particularly the next generation. We'll now listen to His Excellency Prime Minister Stephenson King of St. Lucia. The floor is yours, Excellency. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Master of Ceremonies. Louise and others of the Foundation, Madam Prime Minister, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I want to first and foremost thank Louise for having extended this invitation to me to address some of the very critical issues regarding emerging economies and how it affects our people. I believe that the global economy has since time immemorial been characterized by asymmetrical and evident in the economic disparity among and within nations. We have seen asymmetries that are evident in the economic disparity among and within nations, educational and health gaps, technological gaps, and even what some may describe as expectation gaps. In essence, these various gaps donate the differences in the level and rate of development and the chances of bridging the economic divide between those who have managed the economies and those who have realized significant economic growth and others that continue to struggle against the tidal waves of the global political economy. Some countries have undoubtedly fared better than others, seeming to appear almost suddenly on the world scene previously sleeping economic giants that have awakened, such as Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the BRICS, as they are called. Allow me some time to probably ponder on the category of emerging economies. One cannot deny that these countries though faced with very different circumstances, must navigate in a world where it sometimes appears that the rules of the game seem fitted in, um, tilted in favor of some at the expense of others. The optimism is perhaps derived from the notion that the global political economy is a level playing field, though admittedly, some may have gained an advantage by having a head start. Even as these emerging economies endeavor to create a space for themselves in the international arena, they are confronted with the harsh realities of an asymmetrical world system. Notwithstanding that exogenous reality, these countries recognize that their own internal socio-economic and political environment may need to be revamped or restructured considerably to satisfy the requirements of good governance, transparency and accountability, arguably the key ingredients to realize an economic growth and development in a neoliberal world. It means, therefore, that before these countries can reasonably expect to make any significant strides in the international arena, that there are a whole host of ex endogenous factors that need to be addressed or tweaked so as to qualify them to participate in the first instance and secondly, reap any presumed benefits from their participation. Perhaps one of the greatest challenges to emerging economies internally is the extent to which the state can convince the populace 
that there are benefits to be accrued for their participation and contribution. A cursory examination of the states that have made economic strides over the last 50 or so years will show that special interests, geographic salience, resource endowment, and political alliances are all important factors in determining the level of success. The real challenge, therefore, is making the necessary internal adjustments that will, in a sense, pre-qualify states to participate in a benefit from interactions at the global level. There is no auto automaticity implied here. What, the needs, what then needs to happen to facilitate the growth and development of those who are now entering the race? For most of the emerging economies, the terms of trade with which they are confronted are skewed, often posing a tremendous challenge given that they are yet to match the industrial might of the economic giants, the G8 countries, for example. For many, market access is not enough without special status, like the most favored nation status. Granted to many of the new economic giants, many of the remaining trade barriers, especially those of a non-tariff nature, could be removed to allow entry of goods and services in a one-way direction for a reasonable period of time. Access to capital is another crucial element in the emerging status equation. For a state with a large population, mobilizing local capital may not be a problem. For small states that have emerged on the world scene, this remains a critical factor. The local capital base is weak and way below threshold level. Development requires investment in infrastructure, in education, in health, in food security, meeting increasingly high cost of energy, etc. For many of the emerging economies, finance is required, but at concessionary terms, if it is to be helpful. In fact, the latest World Bank report has some economies with a debt to GDP of 100 to 150 percent. The implications are all too obvious, and we know too that this is not sustainable. How can these countries escape the entrapment of poverty and underdevelopment? How can the international community facilitate their growth and economic advancement. Notwithstanding the endemic asymmetrics of the international system and the inequity and inequality that characterize it, adopting a fatalistic posture is not an option. One would like to think that there is room for elevation in the system. Immediately, some may argue that perhaps a good starting point would be to emulate those who would have gone before us and have fared well. Let us not forget, however, that the conditions under which these new developed countries have been able to excel are markedly different from what obtains today. Even so, there are some key fundamentals that must be satisfied both internally and externally to facilitate the growth of the late comers and stragglers. These are to ensure public safety, to guarantee food security, environmental sustainability, ensuring health security, and investing in education. Also, the critical need for good government governance. One obvious and potentially highly impactful change would be to revamp the rules that govern the international financial system, especially as regards development financing for smaller or emerging economies. For example, perhaps this might be an appropriate forum to begin the dialogue, given the imminent annual meeting of the IMF 
and the World Bank, which will be held next month. New ways of thinking about our global reality must ne necessarily be cognizant of the particularities of and differences among nations. Perhaps this could become the new clarion call of the Louis Blowing Foundation to champion the cause of those who are too weak, too small, too marginalized to make known their case, highlighting the particularities of their societies that somehow impede their socioeconomic advancement. This is not, however, a plea to highlight or respond to their vulnerabilities. Instead, this is a call to assist them in strengthening their resilience. I thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and thank you for reminding us of these asymmetries and the necessary reforms required internally to ensure growth and development of, of emerging economies. We'll now listen to His Excellency President Lobo Sosa of Honduras. You have the floor, sir. Muy buenas días. Un saludo muy especial a su excelencia, la primera ministra de Trinidad y Tobago, Can la presa Vicesar. To its excellency, the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Carla Persaud. Primer ministro de Santa Lucia, don Stephenson King. Prime minister of Santa Lucia, Stephenson King. Y a nuestro moderador, el director general de Unido, Cande Junquela. And our monitor, Mr. Cande Junquela. Junquela. Y un saludo a Luis Blue. And a special greeting to Luis. Y a todos ustedes, un saludo muy especial. And all of you, a special greeting. Y gracias por esta oportunidad de compartir experiencias. Thank you for this opportunity. Y de compartir reflexiones. Share experiences. Sobre un mundo que hoy demanda About a mucho world mayor medida. Un compromiso de todos. A compromise for all. Y un tema muy importante que ustedes traen a la, a la mente de nuestra en el día de hoy es el tema del liderazgo. And a very important subject that it comes to mind of all of us, a leadership uh, theme. Porque uno de los puntos importantes en estos temas de cambios, de los cambios que hay que hacer, de innovaciones en una era tan dinámica, es el tema del liderazgo, un liderazgo creativo, one, con of the, one of the most important things uh, in this era to uh, do are changes of leadership, changes of innovation. Leaders que podamos soñar y tener una visión y un camino definido hacia dónde vamos y qué es lo que queremos hacer y creer y crear y ver. Leaders able to dream and and lead the way to uh, paths that are creative and in the direction of the things we would like to create. Y claro, el objetivo fundamental que perseguimos es el mejoramiento de la condición de vida de la persona humana. The most important objective that we would like to achieve is the development of the individual. Porque si es compromiso que debemos tener los líderes es entender que cualquier actividad que desarrollemos tiene un objetivo. It's the compromise the leaders we have to understand that everything that we uh, visualize it has an objective. Que es el mejoramiento de los hombres y mujeres que viven en estos países, la persona humana. Which is the betterment of the people that lives in our country, men and women, the human person. Y los retos son enormes. En Honduras tenemos dos de cada tres familias que viven en pobreza. Challenges are immense. In Honduras, we have two to three families that live in poverty. Una de las grandes debilidades que tenemos es que nosotros no tenemos en Honduras, no hemos tenido en Honduras una visión a largo plazo. One of the weak points that we have had in Honduras is that we haven't had uh, uh, an extended view uh, Cada cuatro años tenemos cambio de gobierno. Every four years we have a changing government. 
Y es importante porque el pueblo puede ir a las urnas y expresar allí su decisión de a quién quiere que le dirija. And it's very important because every four years the people go to the, uh, to the vote, uh, to the elections to elect the people who they want to lead. Pero el gran problema es que cada presidente llegaba y hacía lo que él consideraba que debería de hacerse. The great problem is being that every president that has arrived have done whatever he thought he should and, and wanted to do. Y todos los partidos políticos después de tres periodos de gobierno de diálogos nos pusimos de acuerdo en concretar un plan de nación. And every Uh, political party after three governments uh, we have uh, decided to create a national plan ese plan de nación nos nos une en torno a una visión compartida la honduras que queremos ver en 28 años is the nation plan is a dream of a vision of a honduras that we would like to see in 28 years y claro que estamos hablando nosotros de un Honduras donde tengamos mejores ingresos para las familias. And of course, it's an Honduras, it's a Honduras that we're speaking about, of a better uh, income Honduras for the families. Donde un, una Honduras donde nuestro pueblo. A Honduras where our country, our people. Que hoy que estamos en la era de la información, como ustedes muy bien lo han señalado y compartido con Luis, le decía que en los últimos 30 años, ha circulado más información que en los 5,000 años precedentes. And uh, in this era of technology and information, as I was speaking to Luis, uh, in these last 30 years, more information has circulated than in the past 5,000 years. La educación se convierte en, uno de la, de, en la tarea más importante que tenemos que impulsar. Education has become the most important task that we have to uh, Approach. Si bien es cierto los recursos naturales, la posición geográfica son importantes y si apostamos a la educación, lograremos un verdadero cambio en nuestros países. It is true that the natural resources are important, but true the education is the most important segment that we have to address. Estamos hablando de apostar más a lo que es el desarrollo de la actividad productiva en el campo. We're speaking about Uh, how to develop the productivity of the agricultural sector. Igual, pues, que uno de los temas importantes que se ha tocado es la energía renovable, energía limpia. Y las potencialidades que esto significa para agua potable, para riego, para los cultivos, para el manejo de cuencas, igual que lo que es el, hasta para turismo, para el geoturismo. It's very important the availability of water, the possibility of water, to provide it for the agriculture sector, for all the sectors, including the tourism. In Honduras, we have more than 70% of energy thermic. In Honduras, we have uh, more than 70% of thermic energy. One of the governments anterior me decía un ministro de ese gobierno que era más barata que la renovable. One of the ministers of the prior government uh, told me that that energy was more less expensive. La falta de la visión. Hoy dijimos hay que invertir la ecuación. But there was a lack of vision. Today we say we have to invest. Y reciente firmamos con Sino Hidro, una compañía china que invierte en hidroeléctricas. We just uh, have signed with lo, a, a hydroelectric Chinese company. Lo que equivale al 50% prácticamente de lo que hoy tenemos como necesidades en lo que es energía en Honduras. Uh, approximately a 50% of the equivalent of what we need and what we have in Honduras today for energy. Igual estamos, igual estamos firmando con otras compañías y con inversionistas nacionales para otros proyectos hidroeléctricos, de energía eólica, eh, de energía solar también. We also are investing with other uh, in, uh, national investors for uh, aeolic energy and lo, wind power. You can go ahead. In yeah. los tres años con dos, con cuatro meses que me faltan de gobierno, muchos de estos proyectos no los voy a ver, pero voy a ver para inicios del nuevo gobierno que venga en Honduras 
un presidente o una presidenta que estén ustedes aquí diciendo, mire, hoy tenemos 70 de energía limpia y un poco de energía térmica. In the remaining three, and, uh, three years and two months that I have left as president, I may not be able to see the results of this investment, but I will see it in the next uh, government where the new president uh, will be able to tell that we already have, or today we have a 70% of clean energy. Tenemos que impulsar más el turismo, apoyar lo que es la, eh, también desarrollar más la infraestructura, igual que todos los programas de agua y saneamiento. Pero para esto ocupamos atraer mucho la inversión. We have to also support uh, the tourism, the infrastructure, the, uh, all the programs to uh, better. Uh... El mejor sistema económico es dejar que la libre iniciativa fluya, aprovechar lo que es la creatividad de lo que es la iniciativa individual y el emprendedurismo, combinado lógicamente con un alto sentido de solidaridad humana, de responsabilidad social. The best way of investment is to allow the independent initiative to, uh, pro to produce uh, these opportunities, of course, uh, supervised or led by the social compromise. Que hoy se ha desarrollado mucho lo que es la responsabilidad social empresarial. Today we have developed a lot the social responsibility. Si yo quiero tener empleos en Honduras, tengo que tener inversión, porque el peor enemigo de generar empleos es la, la ausencia de inversión. If I would like to generate employment in Honduras, I need the investment. The worst enemy of uh, the economy is no employment con responsabilidad social and the responsibilities y estamos en este esfuerzo de, de tener un país que facilite más la inversión que podamos tener una fluidez en lo que son los trámites que a veces son muy engorrosos para poder nosotros tener condiciones que sean que sean muy agradables a la inversión como lo que son reglas claras y definidas we're putting a plan and a clear view into uh, bring an investment uh, into our plan of development. Mi participación en las Naciones Unidas, yo insistía en que debemos estar hablando ya de un nuevo acuerdo global, porque estamos hablando de los eh, retos del milenio para el 2015. ¿Qué pasa después del 2015? Pues yo creo que es tiempo de empezar a hablar de un gran acuerdo global, sobre todo y que el mundo se ha globalizado cada vez más. My compromise in the, my participation in the United Nations is to uh, promote a global plan, uh, a compromise. Uh, we're talking about in 2015, but what's going to happen after that? Y me fascina lo de la, la globalización, pero quiero ver un mundo que bien se globalice en lo que es el comercio, las comunicaciones, pero que también se globalice la solidaridad. Uh, I'm fascinated by globalization, and I like to see uh, the finances, the uh, communications globalized, but I would like also to see the social compromise globalized. Un mundo en el cual reinen cuatro principios fundamentales. A world that is governed by four principles, fundamental principles. El respeto a la dignidad de la vida humana. A respect for dignity of the human life. El bien común. The well being the welfare for all of us. La solidaridad. Solidarity. Y la participación de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil. Porque el buen gobierno es el gobierno que da mucho poder a las municipalidades, en el caso nuestro, y que tiene una profunda participación de la sociedad civil. And the participation of the civil organizations on the social uh, uh, life and uh, without limiting the power of the municipalities. La democracia tiene dos aspectos. La democracia representativa, que somos los que estamos aquí sentados, sus excelencias del día de hoy, democracy, pero también la democracia participativa. Democracy has two, two faces. The democracy, the representative democracy, the one that we represent over here, all sitting on this panel, and the participa participative uh, democracy. Nos 
pero también tienen derecho a participar todas las organizaciones como la Fundación Louis Boeing. Because we are elected, but all the organizations are able to participate. Esa es la democracia. Foundation of Louis Blount. Esa es la democracia. democracy. Muchas gracias. That's democracy. Thank y you. Por favor, so todos luchemos por un mundo que cada debe sea más solidario. And please, let's fight together for a more solidarian world. Y abramos el corazón y la mente. And Porque open, este let's open our mind and heart. No ha sido un cambio de siglo. Es un cambio de época. Because this is not a change of century. Is a change of era. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and thank you for highlighting again internal challenges of government stability and establishing a long term vision and focusing on human development. We have about 15, 20 minutes. Um, we have about 15, 20 minutes still, okay, for some QA. Um, I'll, I'll pose a few questions and then we'll turn to the audience. Uh, Madam Minister, you, you mentioned the challenge of avoiding the over-dependence on one commodity or one product. How are, you, how are you approaching this? How are you giving incentives to the private sector to venture into manufacturing and other sectors? How, how are you doing this or even attracting FDI into other areas other than oil and gas? FDI is very important to us. Um, uh, because of the dependence on oil and gas that we have to go into the other sectors, there, there, is, there is a sense of change. There always is. And oil and gas is so lucrative. So that the companies that are there are very happy to stay within oil and gas. And the ones that want to come in, they also come in on oil and gas. But um, tremendous resistance to change. What we want to do, we are looking at ICTs. We are looking at building uh, that industry. We are looking at taking to build a competitive advantage in that ar arena. And if I may say, another initiative that we've undertaken in that regard to build that backbone and to um, widen and deepen the ICT industry is that um, we promised to give every child who entered the secondary school a laptop. And so we, we will, we'll be doing that before the end of this month. And then we will continue each first form that comes in. So within five years, every child in the secondary school with that proposal will have a laptop. Building, we see that we need, need to build knowledge-based industries to help us to move away from the dependence on oil and gas. How can we do it? FDI is very important. In the area of food production, in the area of manufacturing, in all those other areas, tourism. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is one of the most diverse nations in the world, cosmopolitan. We are like a United Nations. Um, because every creed and every race has a space and a place in Trinidad and Tobago. And so cultural tourism is very important as well, because you can find the rich of every part of the world in Trinidad and Tobago. But tourism, not just sun and sea and sand, we have that, but we want to go into other areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prime Minister King, you, you, one of the key statements you made here is the challenge of convincing the population to be part of the adjustments that you have to do internally. How are you going about that? It's, it's not particularly easy. You have a vision, but the people are way behind you. How, how are you trying to get them involved in these adjustments? Indeed, it is a challenge for us as a government, particularly in this current environment of global economic um, challenges. First and foremost, you have a population that has uh, grown out of a British system which has been very dependent on a very strong social component of the economy. And one that is uh, where the people themselves are looking to government to provide the daily living. Government happens to be the largest employer in the country. <clears throat> At the same time, they look to government to do everything. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge now is to get them involved and take ownership to what is happening in society. The number of social programs that we have been able to implement in recent times, in which we look towards the holistic development of our people. 
how do you get the people to understand that it's by their own holistic development that they can make a contribution to social and economic, economic development and gain ownership to it. So in a number of instances, for example, in terms of community infrastructure and community development and social development, the government has been able to put together programs whereby we move into communities, engage the people in the community, the young people, the middle age, etc., engage them in those communities, give them the basic training needed to be socially responsible. So we do training in health, in education, in social responsibility, get them to have an appreciation of their own civic responsibility in society, and then put them through certain levels of training that can help them to make that contribution into society. So for example, if there are community infrastructure programs to be done, rather than simply bringing in outside uh, contractors to do those programs, we train them and they themselves get engaged in implementing those programs. So at the end of the day, they receive the training, they participate in the implementation of the program, and they develop a greater consciousness and appreciation for what they have been doing, and then protect their, 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 their infrastructure. So these are some of the, the, the initiatives undertaken Excellent. by government, and of course, the responses by the people. Excellent. President Lobo, yesterday, a president from the Latin America and Caribbean region said, um, it, because of some change in policy in Europe, it's difficult to get bananas in and some agricultural products. And his government lost $45 million in, in, in export revenue, and then he received $10 million in aid. So net, he lost 35, 34, 35 million. You mentioned enhancing productivity in agriculture as one of your key strategies. Now, how do you want to do that in, and when we have not completed the Doha round, so your people can trade their way out of poverty? You have given me a great idea. Eh, me está diciendo que la demanda de alimentos va a aumentar más del 100%, entiendo. You're telling me that the demand for food is going to increase more than 100%. So, si tenemos nosotros, yo mencionaba a ustedes que tenemos dos de cada tres familias que viven en pobreza en la... I just mentioned to you that we have two or three families that live in poverty. En la zona rural, cuatro de cada cinco familias viven en pobreza. And in the rural areas, four out of five families live in poverty. Para nosotros pensar en desarrollar Honduras, parte importante pasa por el desarrollo del campo. For us to develop Honduras, the most important part it will be to develop the rural, y tenemos grandes the rural areas. Y tenemos grandes posibilidades. And we have great possibilities. Uno es que podemos, tanto para la producción interna, la demanda interna de alimentos, como la de la demanda externa que tenemos también de algunos productos. Number one, to provide for the national demand and international demand of products. Y algo muy interesante es que nos liga directamente con beneficiar a familias de menores ingresos. And very important thing, an interesting thing is that something that ties us with uh, support families with low income. For example, la Corporación del Desarrollo del Milenio. For example, the Corporation del, del for the Development of the Millennium. Eh, es un programa que ha ayudado mucho en Honduras porque en muchas áreas ha llevado a las personas a producir cultivos para la exportación. It's a program that have helped Honduras very much because it have helped uh, families to produce uh, products for, exp for export. Ha habido casos en los cuales el, el ingreso de la familia se ha aumentado en 20 veces. There have been cases where the income of the family have increased by 20 times. Simplemente con diversificar, salir del cultivo tradicional del maíz y además de esto, con la capacidad de poder exportar. By simply diversifying the products, coming out of the corn production, 
and the capability of exporting. El mercado más importante que tenemos es Estados Unidos. The most important market that we have is the United States of America. Y tenemos un, eh, un acuerdo de libre comercio. And we have uh, a trade of freedom, uh, uh, free trade. Free trade. commercial trade. Free trade agreement. Okay. Y además de esto, tenemos también nosotros en otras áreas cultivos importantes como la palma africana. We have in, in, other, in other areas, we have uh, important uh, uh, crops like the African palm. Que nos da el aceite que también nos sirve como para producir combustibles con limpios, como el tema de los biocombustibles. That it produces oil, that it gives us the opportunity to produce fuel, clean fuel. Con un beneficio adicional. With one additional benefit. Que vamos a hacerlo con cooperativas campesinas. That we've been doing this and we're going to do this with uh, uh, rural co uh, cooperatives. Queremos que los productores organizados, los cooperativas campesinas organizadas, siembren la tierra, produzcan y que podamos tener un mayor nivel, pues, de, de cultivo vinculado directamente con elevar el nivel de vida de la, elevar el nivel de vida de la gente. We would like that uh, the produce organizations they get together and they produce and they uh, have the ability to uh, provide their uh, products with our support. Y es un error pensar que ellos no pueden hacerlo. And it's a big mistake not to think that they cannot do it. Así como educación, la gente lo que ocupa es la oportunidad. Uh, the same as education that the people need is the opportunity. For el mundo es de oportunidades. Thank Estamos you. haciéndolo en el campo. The world is a world of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience for, for our panel? Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Um, this presentation is for the Prime Minister of Trinidad. Um, this question is for Prime, so, um, Prime Minister Trinidad and Tobago. Um, what initiatives are being put in place by CARICOM um, to create a more unified Caribbean region? Thank you very much. CARICOM has the, the 14 member nation states of the CARICOM are all committed. My brother is here from St. Lucia. Remain very committed to the integration movement, to the development of a, a single market and economy. But um, when at our last heads of uh, government meeting, we were of the view that the governance structures within the CARICOM had long outlived the usefulness to take us further forward. Um, there are several initiatives, of course, there's a legislative, but we, we felt that we needed to change the governance structure to meet the present day needs. So, and that's, if, I if I have to say, what are we doing? That's a major something. We have legislative uh, arrangements uh, with our various parliaments where we have recently passed uh, legislation for the CARICOM itself, for the Caribbean Court of Justice, which has been very controversial in some of the nation states. Um, and so having common institutions, but I do not believe that we have gone far enough, deep enough, or wide enough in terms of that integration movement. We have passed a uh, the free movement of skilled nationals from one, uh, one island to the next, one nation to the other. But I think my brother here would agree with me, a f fellow CARICOM uh, nation, that we still have a very, very long way to go. But what is important, we remain committed to that vision and that mission to have an integrated regional movement. The regional blocks are very important, in addition, of course, to multilateral and international. So thank you for your question. Any, any addition? Yes, sir. Um, I have a question for all three of the speakers. Um, I will be on the panel about cities, so when I'm listening to these questions of the reduction of poverty and economic development, with the little I know about your three countries, one of the things that's most charming and fabulous about them is their rural environment. And so the issue of some of the development uh, policies you're describing have a very unique idea about sustaining the rural environment in its authentic condition while reducing poverty, which is, in my view, uh, just as important to the nature of a city 
as it is to the, in other words, the contrast between cities and landscape are one of the most delicious things the world has to offer. Suburbia for me is a bigger problem and um, the question of economic development spawning great tracts of suburbia as opposed to sustaining the rural, exquisite rural environments that you're describing is a very interesting one uh, so that the suburban model is no longer considered the economically prosperous one and the contrast between the rural and the urban one or civic one is very interesting and I'm wondering how much consideration you have about the spatial and cultural aspects of this development, where you can address that. Prime, Prime Minister King, you want to give that a shot? Yes, let me quickly um, address it. Uh, first and foremost, to say that the approach that our government, my government, has given and, and previous administrations in St. Lucia is one of a focus on education throughout the country, whether it's in the city, suburban or the rural communities. Uh, we certainly boast of having universal primary education, universal secondary education, and hopefully universal tertiary education, meaning that you give every child, every individual an opportunity to education, as education certainly is the entry to economic development. On the other hand, we also recognize the significance of our cultural strengths. And so the, the intention at this time is to look at education in a very diverse manner by creating that diversity that is necessary so as to exploit the full potential of each and every citizen, each and every child emerging in, in our country so as to see St. Lucia or see their potential beyond the borders of St. Lucia, to see the potential as the world stage and prepare themselves for the world stage. We, also do, we do this also within the environment of, 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 of the fact that our economy is one that has been built strongly on an on agricultural base. And so with the diversity that we focus on, the need to give our young people the, the strengthened culture and appreciation of the importance of agriculture in their whole livelihood, the sustainability of their own living. And, and these are some of the approaches that, that we've been looking at in more recent times, and we hope to continue in responding to those, the many challenges that we have faced in our country. Okay, I think, uh, President Lobo, uh, you might, you might want to uh, uh, also tackle that uh, question, but can you link it also with this challenge of establishing a long-term vision? Governments change every four years. <laughs> a new government comes, throws everything out, you start all over again. So you're always reinventing the wheel. But link it with what she's saying, a bigger vision of even watching the spatial distribution of resources, investments, and people. You know, in two, three minutes, and then we wrap up. <laughs> Yo tengo, tengo derecho al doble del tiempo porque pierdo la mitad en la traducción. I have uh, the right to have double of the time because I lose a lot of time in the translation. <laughs> <laughs> we wish we had it off time, but. Ella ha tocado un tema que para mí es muy importante. Para nosotros los hondureños touch a subject that is very important for us. Es la riqueza de la diversidad cultural que tenemos. It's the richness of the cultural diversity we have. Y cuando uno va a las comunidades afro-hondureñas y va a las comunidades indígenas. When we uh, go to the communities, the Afro-Honduran communities and indigenous communities. Admira la riqueza cultural que tienen ellos. We admire the cultural richness they have. They possess. Le le decimos a ellos, mire, yo quiero verlos que mantengan sus tradiciones, su cultura. So we tell them that we want them to maintain their culture, their, their richness. Pero que vivan en mejores condiciones. But to live in better conditions. Que el mejorar su condición de vida no les aparte de sus tradiciones, porque su riqueza cultural es extraordinaria that the betterment, the way of life for them won't take them away from their traditions and culture. Yo inicié el gobierno en enero 27. 
I started my government in January 27. Soy el octavo presidente de la última etapa democrática de Honduras que inicia el 27 de enero. El mío es el octavo. I'm the eighth president of the democratic era of Honduras that starts on January 27. Y envié ya al Congreso Nacional la creación del Ministerio de las Comunidades Afrodescendientes e Indígenas. And I just sent to Congress the uh, proposal of the Ministry of the Afro Descendants and Indigenous Communities. Para que esta, ese, ese Ministerio del Ejecutivo se encargue directamente de ver cómo mantenemos su riqueza cultural, cómo impulsamos la educación trilingüe, que and, es el español, inglés y su lengua nativa. And that ministry is going to oversee the uh, way of maintaining their development and keeping them uh, uh, with their traditions and culture alive, and the development of three languages, which is the English, Spanish, and their own indigenous language. Y el plan de nación que me pregunta el señor Junquela divide a Honduras en regiones. And the plan, uh, national plan of the nación, the pl el plan de nación that Mr. John Kerra is uh, asking about divides Honduras in three sections. 16 regions. 16 regions. Entonces, la idea es de que cada región decida incluso en el tema del presupuesto lo que va a invertir en educación, en salud, e infraestructura en todo. And this will allow each region to decide how much they're going to invest in education, health, and development. El presupuesto 2011 ya va estructurado de acuerdo a lo que es la decisión de cada una de las regiones. And that uh, budget for 2011 is going to be uh, developed uh, in the needs of each region. Han sido discusiones abiertas del presupuesto. Por primera vez en la historia se va a la región y se enseña el presupuesto y ellos opinan, expresan y deciden. We have had for the first time an open uh, discussion about the budget. We go to the region, we present it to them, and they uh, discuss and about it. Porque no hay, por muy bueno que un gobierno sea, nunca va a tener la fuerza de un pueblo decidido en su ruta hacia el desarrollo en concretar su visión. Uh, doesn't matter how strong a government may be, it won't have the power of and the will of the people uh, who wants to develop their own. Thank you, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time and to save, let me wrap up a little bit. Just some issues here that you've seen on this panel. I, thank you very much the way you structure the panel, rich oil and gas, agroeconomy, but the challenge of diversification. The issues that uh, Madam Prime Minister raised are the same issues if you talk to the president of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, Ghana, even Chad, even Mauritania. You discover natural wealth. The investments come only for that sector, nothing else. It's all taken out, you're poor again. In this 21st century, that cannot continue. That was mercantilism of the 1600s, but it is still happening today and more relevant, particularly for Africa. Everybody is coming to Africa today. For oil and gas, yesterday, uh, uh, one of the numbers given was that the 20 million people of New York City enjoy more electricity than the 780 million people living in Sub-Saharan Africa. But guess what? The Gulf of Guinea, where I originate from, from Angola to Mauritania, we might be supplying 20% of the US oil. Don't we have a right to energy security? Don't we have a right to diversification of our economy? I say to, to people, our children want to come to the United States and to Europe as tourists, not as illegal immigrants. In sourcing natural resources, we're destroying ecosystems, but, but we can do it differently. We can make those people wealthy. We can make them rich so there is global stability. And I believe the Obama administration is paying attention to that. Agriculture. We have been talking to the poor of the world about trading your way out of poverty. We could not still complete the Doha round. Subsidies in agriculture, 
for commodities or products that our poor people can produce and sell to the rest of the world. In this interconnected world, the community of nations you mentioned, <coughs> countries are no longer foot, foot, uh, foot, footnotes. If they are not stable, if their people are not wealthy, then the democracies will not hold. There will be loss of hope, civil strife, and chaos. When you have that, what we are calling failed states, then you get global instability. We, when I was a student here, we were looking at Somalia. It was a footnote. It was a footnote. But Somalia, because of bad governance now, 17 years, no state functioning. It's a hotbed of Al-Qaeda. I say to Americans, we're all in this together. We want to supply the world, but you know something? We want prosperity too. And that was the American model. That's how Asia emerged. The rest of our countries, in Africa, in the Caribbean, and, and also elsewhere, we need the same. Finally, Bob Zelek says, and, and strauss can, the global economy is safe today because there are markets elsewhere. Other nations are growing, so there is demand. If we ensure that these economies also grow, and there's purchasing power, that's your opportunity at the bottom of the pyramid. Thank you very much. We thank our panel.